All right, so we're going to uh, call the meeting to order. And um, we're going to be talking about the budget, but before that, it, is it in the opening that we can uh, add some items to the agenda? Yeah. So yeah. where would you like to do that? So and these your proposal? would probably be a part of the consent agenda. Um, and, you know, we can have discussion about what they are. Um, we had uh, got the results from the new state-led uh, testing law. We had some issues at um, Randolph Union. Um, letters have gone out to folks to kind of describe uh, what's happening. But we want to do the repair works as quickly as possible. We want to access the reserve funds to do that. So one of the requests is to um, tap into about $19,000 of um, facilities reserve funds to replace the pipes, the sinks, and the faucets. Um, because uh, one of the issues was in the kitchen at the RUHS and so part of it is we had designs on replacing a lot of the equipment in there because it's getting older anyway mm -hmm. and so it seems like if we're gonna have to rip everything out as well we may as well replace everything that's attached to it at the same time. Um, the second uh, comes from Danny from our transportation coordinator. Uh, they got a notification that the cost of buses because the supply line issues is going to go up dramatically in the next week or two. And so we decided it was probably better to try to scramble to get the money for our normal bus replacements, um, you know, early. Um, and so one of the pieces is looking to tap into the transportation reserve fund to replace two of the oldest buses in the fleet, um, as well as a 14 person student van. Um, that's usually used for our students um, that go out to outplacement. Um, the two vans that they have, it's actually going to be replacing two. One of them, the transmission is, is shot, and the other one is just getting so old that it's not reliable. Um, and then the two buses are, the, again, the oldest in the fleet, um, you know, over 100,000 miles, and they rattle over the old back roads. Um, so typically we try to replace one to two of them a year, always the oldest. And I should know this by now, but I don't. Remember, in order to use reserve fund funding, we need to we need to vote on that separately, or can we? You could uh, you could do a motion right to in. add it to consent agenda, and so it would be a part of just voting on the consent agenda. Okay. So, do we have uh, Megan? We'll move to add the bus. Addition to the consent agenda. And the no. lead. And the oh, lead. and the lead. And the lead. Yeah. Mitigation. Mitigation. Hannah seconds. Thank you. If anybody is interested, these are the quotes. And All those in favor of those? Yeah. And the quotes I, are in the. Yeah, we have those. They're in here. Yeah, yeah. 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 they're in here. Yeah. 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 So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Pass, Linda. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so primarily this meeting, we're going to be talking about the budget tonight. Um, and uh, I need to have someone do the meeting evaluation. I can do it. All right. We're going to have Thanks. Megan do that. And do have a copy of that? Yeah. Is it usually in here? Well, well I usually send it out in the packet. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, public comment. So do we have anyone either online or in the audience who would like to make public comment? I don't have anything on the budget. This is, this is just this is general, just general, right general now. anything. My name is John Helfant, and uh, I guess I have several issues. I'll just pick up one or two and make them short. Uh, the masking of children in school. Uh, I think the board should really consider doing away with it. I know it's against the guidelines for the state. Uh, CDC study that came out that said that cloth masks are not effective against COVID. 
I know uh, I saw an email about the ordering of 2,095 masks for the students, which could work, but uh, the rate that children touch masks, I've actually seen several of you touch your masks since we've been here, uh, introduces virus and bacteria to, to the child's face, and uh, it creates a situation where they could actually introduce virus and get sick. Um, there was also a UVM study last year which showed the incidence of uh, COVID infection. Uh, it was almost insignificant between mask wearers and non-mask wearers. Uh, in fact, mask wearers had a slightly higher incidence of infection. Again, uh, I believe that's because people touch their masks all the time. The study proposed that um, the higher incidence was due to people being too close to each other, not paying attention because they thought the mask was a crutch and uh, relied on it too much. But uh, I, it's the only part of the study I disagree with them on. I think it's from people touching their mask and it uh, actually transmit virus. It's, it's like rubber gloves for a surgeon. Um, you know, every time you touch a door handle, if you're not cleansing your hands before you touch your mask, you're introducing stuff to it. So you can put N95s on a kid all day, but if they're not cleaning their hands and then keeping their hands out of their facial area, those N95s are gonna be ineffective and they're gonna burn through them in no time. Anytime they touch it, they should be disposing of it and putting another one on. In my profession, I also wear N95s occasionally, and if you don't have them fit properly and wear them properly, they're useless. They're, they're no better than this thing I have on my face, which does nothing according to the CDC. So, um, and there's huge detriments to children. Um, they can't visualize other children, their facial expressions, just speaking. You know, young children, they develop speech by watching people speak and the movement of their lips and their faces, and masks really are a detriment to that. So uh, I would highly recommend that, even though the state says you should wear masks, uh, I don't think there's anything that really says the board has to follow them. But, and I would propose that you get rid of masks in, in schools. Um, <clears throat> just on a real basic science thing, um, it's a virus, um, you're not gonna stop it. You're just not. Um, you, you can't. Uh, we don't stop the common cold. We don't stop influenza. We've had viruses and live with viruses. I'm 53 years old. Uh, when I had chicken pox, the whole the whole community came over, started you know rolling around on the ground with me to spread the chicken pox because everybody wanted to get it when they were young. Um, there's lots of viruses that damage us and hurt us, and that's just part of life. And the best thing we can do is. Uh, Quite honestly, for children, just concentrate on them keeping their hands clean, keep their hands out of their facial area. Um, but masks are really not um, a big contributor to helping them out and keeping virus free. Um, I guess I've said enough for tonight. I'll save a topic for the next time I'm here. Thanks. So I just want to let you know when we do public comment, we don't get, it's not a dialogue, just so I you understand. know that's just the way it's set up. Yeah. So just so that's, that's why you're not going to hear a response. Okay. Well, thank you for coming and thank you for your comment. Okay. Um, Can I have a quick comment? Sorry, I didn't see you. It's okay. It's quick. It's short. I just wanted to say that um, I think the wording in tonight's board meeting materials did a much better job of explaining the lead issue in the water. I just wanted to share that observation. That I got the I got an email as a parent today that felt like the I mean it felt like the email was a little bit more alarming. And then when I read the tonight's meeting materials. There was something in the way it was presented. I think I think it had to do with, you know, what what locations tested high versus just barely high. I think that was really helpful that I didn't get out in the email. So I just wanted to share that observation. When I went back and read the emails from the principals, there was nothing wrong with it. It was just I just felt like it came across as a little more alarming than than maybe it really is. So I just wanted to share that in case you get feedback from parents. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. 
Anyone else online? Can they raise their hand? They can raise their hand if they want to talk, right? It, they've got a, so if you're online and you want to say something, there, there should be a, a hand symbol that you can click on so we can see that. Okay, so seeing no other comments, we'll move along to the annual report. Um, so this is the uh, report that gets put in the town, uh, town reports and also in the glossy um, annual report of the district. This is last year's. Um, it, it will go in there as well. Um, this is from the board as a whole. Um, and hopefully you had a chance to read through it. Um, Chelsea and I met with um, Ben Merrill to sort of discuss what we wanted to put in there. And that was after we had previously discussed it as a board also. Um, so I just want to express my appreciation to both of you for doing that, for taking the time. Thank you. You're welcome. So are there, as people have reviewed it, was there anything that you wanted to add or any edits that? I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we need to approve this um, annual report. So can I, I make the motion that we approve the annual report as written? Okay, I Brian. second. We have a second from Ashley. Uh, any discussion? Uh, so all those in favor of using this annual report, please say aye. 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 Okay, and it passes. Okay. Um, so you all got the message from well, either from Linda or from Jackie, um, and then from me. Um, Jackie, because of uh, some her own uh, uh, need to be able to take care of someone with some uh, health issues. She wasn't feeling comfortable coming to meet with us in person, and she didn't feel like it would be a useful training if she wasn't here with us in person. Um, so that has now been postponed. Um, so hopefully she said you know, by later in, you know, after our, our March meeting and we reorganize that, you know, we, at that point, hopefully things will be in a better position and we can uh, be ready to work with her. And hopefully by then the COVID stuff will be kind of dying back down again, so. Well, we may have new members. And we're gonna have so new members, timing. possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, Uh, okay, so are there any questions about that or concerns or, no, because I was just letting, letting everyone know. Um, so next up we have the monitoring reports that we had ha we've had for a while now. So one is the financial planning and budgeting. Um, so, Lane, do you want to, do you have anything you want to sort of yeah, uh, further share with us about Some about of it's that? a follow-up kind of from the discussion at the last meeting. Um, so, again, this is uh, financial planning and budgeting. Um, it's about ensuring that the budget aligns with board's ends. Um, and that the practices that we're using uh, are always putting us in the black at the end of the school year. Right? Those are the basic requirements of it. And making sure that you know we're making our predictions based upon reasonable data that's out there. So we had that financial questionnaire um, that uh, comes up every year, and so I went and did a little bit of research on it. It's kind of a, it's one of those documents that really has no place, um, but I can give you kind of the background on it. Um, I did add it as the evidence in support of the limitations report. It looks like it was created by the Secretary of State many years ago. 
uh, in response to a need to strengthen oversight in terms of financial operations. It's really, I think, intended from what I could tell to make sure that the boards are aware of who's responsible for what and then what the basic processes are that are going on within the, within the district. So that's kind of its, its purpose. Um, one of the questions that came up at the last board meeting, I think it was actually Ann that brought it up, was pretty astute today. You know, it says that, you know, the board's not receiving financial training. Are we supposed to? As far as we could tell, there is no requirement. Um, but the VSBA does offer, you know, financial training for, for board members if it's something that's of interest. Um, so just to kind of follow up on that. And I do report compliance in terms of uh, executive limitations policy. Okay, so as board members, as we are looking at this, again, what we're looking for is, uh, you know, what were his interpretations of the policy um, reasonable? Um, and did he provide sufficient evidence to show that he was in compliance with those interpretations? So did anyone see anything that they were concerned about? Right. So, do we have uh, a motion to approve the monitoring report on financial planning and budgeting? I make the motion that we approve uh, EL 2.4 financial planning and budgeting as submitted. Do I have a I second? Have seconding. Any discussion? Uh, all those in favor of accepting the financial planning and budgeting monitoring report? Aye. Aye. So that passes. And then the next uh, monitoring report is on uh, emergency superintendent succession. So um, that's where, uh, well, we'll let Lane explain this is basically just in preparation if something were to happen to him um, sort of making sure there are things in place so that someone can fill in his duties um, right away and that's really what it's about it's, um, it's just it's making sure that the district can operate on kind of an extended temporary basis you know, should the superintendent become incapacitated um, at this current point in time, there are two central office members that have uh, signed, sealed, and delivered and notarized letters from me granting them my authority, um, should that happen. Um, one is Kayla Link, the other is Robin Pembroke, um, who are, um, since they're in the central office, they know most of what's going on. The cabinet is in a good position to be able to help um, should anything occur. We meet at least twice uh, a month. Um, we go over kind of all the things that are, are pertinent that are happening in the district. We do all the policy discussions and the planning and whatnot so that everybody's in the loop on that. Could pick things up for a short while if need be. And then as we kind of move over into the budget discussion in a, in a little while, we'll talk a little bit um, about you know, the potential for the assistant superintendent position, um, which would help further kind of fit into this executive limitation um, so that we've got somebody in there who's, who's really trained who can really step in and stuff up. They do report compliance on that. Okay. So again, are we comfortable with Lane's interpretation of this policy? And has he provided us with enough evidence to show compliance? Are people feeling comfortable? No concerns? Okay, so can we have a motion to approve uh, policy 2.5 uh, monitoring report, emergency superintendent succession? I'll move, uh, Megan, sorry. Megan will move to accept 2.5. I second, Ashley. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Oh. All right. That's why they I'm assuming those are eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. 
So uh, next we have the warning for the uh, budget. And Wayne, did you want to speak to us a little bit here yeah, about what's about going on? All right, let's um, go. Part of it, I mean, I got to pull up our presentation here in a minute. Uh, part of it is because when you hit that consent agenda, there's actually a lot of little separate items that you're voting on that are um, related to the budget. There's three separate budgets um, that you would potentially be approving tonight. There's the Raven budget, the RTCC, and then the overall OSSD budget. So we'll talk about those in a little bit of detail. Um, there's also a discussion about you know what my recommendations are to do with the surplus. Uh, and that, that happens um, every, every time this year. Um, and then there is also, uh, I don't even know if it needs to be much of a discussion, but um, under the state law, we're, we are required to announce our tuition rates, um, um, basically based on the timeline at this point. So I'll go over what we projected those to be. So give me just a moment. function they put on and I actually don't mind it but it's irritating because it if you're talking and you're looking at it at the same time as this <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about um, the Randolph Technical Center budget and kind of two slides on this a little bit of where things are at and in the second slide I'll, I'll talk about kind of the causes you know why why things have shifted a bit here so if you take a look over on the left column there, right, the current total budget, that's the year that we're living in right now, um, is about $2.9 million. Um, what we're requesting for uh, the next fiscal year, next year, is $3.1. Um, the total change, the total increase is $143,000. Um, that has an impact on the tuition rate. Um, the current tuition rate this year is $17,679. The tuition rate um, for next year would be 18670 um, and so it's a, a fairly significant change of $991. And so, and you guys interrupt me at any time that there's questions. Um, talk a lot, a little bit about what we call the summary of cause here. Um, based on how the state funding formula works, um, it's really weird. They have a six semester rolling average that they use. Um, they check the enrollment each semester for six semesters. They do an average and they say, this is the number of kids that we will support you with. Well, based upon that, um, we will receive funding for 128 students um, for next year, even though we'll be providing services to approximately 145. And so there is a, a, a good reason why um, you know, you're, you're seeing this increase at this point in time. That eventually will catch up in the averaging, but it'll take a little bit of time. Um, just to be clear, there were no new staff added, uh, but the increase is due to three sources. Um, the first are the supplies and the services for additional students. Um, the second source is uh, the contractually agreed upon salary increases for the staff for next year. Um, those are things we don't have control over. And then we had a number of uh, new staff come in that were taking a higher level of insurance than the, the staff that exited. And so that had a dramatic uh, impact. In, in fact, if you take a look at the pie chart there, about 84% that is up there, that's all contractual stuff. That's all due to health insurance and um, salary increases. Uh, the, the great part is what's left over for managing the additional students that we have. So, thoughts, questions on uh, TechSec? This, um, we did check with where are some of the other technical centers out there. It puts us expense-wise probably in the top third, um, but we are a little bit different. Um, and this is where some of the discussions are coming in with um, Felicia at this point in time. We're different in the fact that we are a full day program. Um, the other programs are half day. We provide the additional courses and classes that students need to take to be able to graduate from their home school as well as make it through the RTCC program. And that does add a significant uh, additional expense. I mean, we've got potentially three teachers there 
um, that are providing those services and each of those teachers you know with uh, between um, salary and benefits are about a hundred thousand dollars a piece um, so it's a, it's a significant portion of the budget there are discussions about um, kind of changing that moving closer to a, a three-quarter or a half day model so that potentially in the morning the kids would receive their instruction in their home schools and then come maybe an hour later um, and attend our TCC. But that's a future discussion. That is something that um, you know Felicia may talk with her advisory board about um, over the coming year. Um, this is kind of where we are at this point. Also remember that um, throughout the budget, um, inflation was what mm -hmm. was that they were estimating six percent. It's actually closer to eight percent this year. So, you know, even just normal supplies and services that we are ordering, um, you know, for students, uh, those have gone up dramatically. So we've got to, got to plan the budget for that. So, Lane, you, you meet with the other superintendents. Do you ever ask them? So we're looking like, you know, with our, our tech center costs are going, going up for these particular reasons, which I'm assuming other superintendents would understand yeah. um, do you ever sort of see if they, that makes them leery about there there are at least one district that is trying to build programming in-house to provide a little bit of the flavor of um, the tech center without having to send the kids to the tech center but technically under the law, it is illegal um, for them to try to twist students who want to go to the tech center um, not to go. Um, they're not supposed to interfere with that if that's what the students desire. Um, so it is, I, I think it's, uh, I think it has an impact, um, but I have not seen it in the data. Our numbers are up. Mm -hmm. And I, I expect they will continue to be. Um, Felicia was doing a pretty good job this year. Um, she had advanced when they are trying to get their enrollment numbers for next year, trying to get the sign-ups going, and, and the numbers appear to be high. So I think yes. we're going to be in good stead. Yeah. So another question. Yeah. Um, with the, the tech centers that happen to do a half-day program, is that also partly because of transportation? I was under the impression that for, uh. our, for our tech center, because of the transportation, it makes it really hard to do a half day. I would argue it's possible. Um, sometimes what happens in districts is, uh, you know, we're one of the few districts that actually provides our own buses. Um, these districts with RTCC, with the tech centers, however, they bus the students into us. If they are using a busing service, if that serv same service has multiple contracts with multiple districts, Sometimes they have to tier their scheduling so that they can deliver the kids for this district and then once that's done then they can move on and, and so sometimes that might have an effect. Um, I can't say definitively but it is, is certainly a possibility. Um, in those districts that are half day the salaries that the teachers are making are either equal to or greater than what our tech center teachers are making for that time. Um, and what they do is that the, um, you know, it's a half day for the kids but the teachers are there for the full day and that's their planning and their prep time um, and their meeting time and all the other duties above and beyond that they, they would normally do. And it sounds like a lot. Um, and then the light bulb went on for me when I was thinking about it. Well, let's compare that to um, a high school teacher. Well, the high school teachers have a seven period um, schedule, right? And they teach five of them. Um, so they've got a significant amount of time off during the day for planning and prep, you know, if it's not being used up with duty. Um, so it would put them, you know, depending upon how it was balanced out, it would put them kind of in the same category for having planning time as what our, our high school teachers do. Um, again, I don't know how serious the discussions are about it, um, but that's, uh, as we look at the budget piece, um, you know, that's a possibility. Um, when you're dealing with small numbers of students um, in a school, small changes have a large impact on the budget, it's just, just the way it is. Um, but she's done a very, very good job of, of, of pulling things together while, while building the program. And remember, you know, they put in additional programming this year. They've got the dentistry program that's in there. They revamped um, the electrical. They revamped the digital media. Um, so there's a, been a significant amount of work that's been done to be able to help draw in more and more students and keep those enrollments up. 
eventually, you know, even if um, the student count stay the same in that 145 range, if that stays steady, um, that averaging will catch up and the, the tuitions will go down. Uh, it's just a matter of that, that additional funding coming into that averaging process. Yeah, last last question, <laughs> and you probably don't know the answer, but uh, judging from the state of the state and and sort of hearing what both parties in the state legislature are talking about, job training being one of them, any any word yet that they uh, might be no, but I have some, some money <laughs> into into tech ed? Um, the state of Vermont has always expressed extreme support for this type of training for students and this type of education. Um, so it was a little shocking when there wasn't a significant amount of support when COVID hit. You know, it was really geared towards the, 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 the regular schools. They did get some money through the GEAR grant, the government. The governor had done some discretionary money through it, uh, but they did not get the kind of support that the other districts did during COVID. So that was a little bit of a shock. I don't know if it was just an oversight or with everything that people were trying to balance and manage if it, if it just got overlooked. Um, but, but I think much more could have been done. So, but I have not heard anything. Leg new legislative session, I think, just opened up this week. Right. Yeah, right. so um, a lot of it, um, most of the discussions, at least with the superintendents, has been around the Act 173. You know what's happened with the special education monies in the block grant system. Um, Raven, um, we spoke about before, nothing has changed since the last time that, that we talked about it. Um, Raven is a specialty program um, for students with um, certain types of disabilities um, that uh, we manage uh, in-house. Um, we also accept uh, tuition in students from uh, other districts that take advantage of this program because it's a really good program that Jim loves. So what we're looking at is uh, the current budget's 266 um, thousand uh, requested for next year is 252. It's gone down a little bit, and the reason that it's gone down a little bit is um, again uh, mostly due to um, one of the staff members over there. There's only two changing their health insurance uh, requirements, um, move to a, a lower plan, um, and so the tuition is actually going down by a significant amount. I was dropping by 14. These students, um, when I was doing some research a couple of uh, years back to see what this uh, program was saving the district, these students, if they were sent anywhere else, uh, would cost anywhere from sixty to one hundred twenty thousand, not including transportation. Um, so it really does. It's a, it's a great program. It helps the students out, but in terms of costs, um, it's incredibly cost effective. And the numbers are still good there. They, um, they turn students away. Um, they typically run around 14 of those 14. On average, three of the kids are ours. Um, the rest come from other schools. There's always folks asking for more. Um, we had tried to actually expand the program when we moved into the new, uh, the new building for them with the idea that if we had to, we could blow the north wall out and extend the building that way. Um, but we couldn't get a second body who had the skill set we needed to be able to do that expansion. We tried for two years, and then we finally just cut it out of the budget. Um, it makes me a little bit nervous. Um, uh, you know, the, the folks that are running it are awesome, and, and hopefully they've got a lot of years left. But should they retire, we might be in a bad way finding a replacement to keep, um, keep that program. a little bit make sure I got all my parts and pieces because there's some details I want to make sure that that's explicit about here for folks. So prior to COVID, um, and we kind of talked about this last year, we actually kind of achieved it last year, was this idea of getting to what's called a level service budget, you know, getting all the structures, all the resources, all the supplies that we need, we get the programming in that we want that think that is supporting the kids towards the ends. And then once we get there, um, we move into what's called level service mode. In other words, it's not, you're not keeping the, 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 the budget the same every year, but only allowing it to go up enough to maintain what we have, right? And so usually it goes up usually to 2%, somewhere between 2 and 3% between, you know, having to, to pay the additions, the salaries that, that are in the contract, um, inflation, things like that. 
Um, but obviously COVID has changed quite a bit um, of our calculus here. And so this particular budget is designed to allow us to adapt to the new needs um, that were created because of the COVID pandemic. Um, and a lot of those needs are in the form of unfinished learning. Um, and we have a whole new, you know, we talked about trauma-based behaviors that interfere with lear learning in the past. We have a whole new type of behavior that we're seeing in the kids that is completely separate um, from what we were experiencing. Um, there is a significant amount of aggression. Um, and I guess the only way I can describe it is the students fall apart over small things. You know, they drop the pencil on the floor and then it's immediately in tears or running out of the classroom. It's, 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 it's at that level. And so those are the things that we're trying to plan um, to, to, to mitigate, to, to mediate. Um, the budget's also designed uh, to allow us to go after all of the ends. Um, you know, we'd spoken earlier about the high cost of trying to pursue everything at once. Um, and since folks actually, the board seemed open to doing this, um, this budget will provide the personnel and resources needed to also pursue um, those final perspective ends, right? We call them perspective because they were ones that were set for the future when we could shift resources to them. Um, and those were primarily the foundational knowledge ends and social studies, life skills, and the arts. And so that's kind of what this budget is, is designed to do. And so I'm gonna freak you out up front and then it's gonna look really good at the end. Um, and the reason that that's gonna happen is because we're gonna talk about expenses first. And the reason we talk about expenses first is because the voters vote on the expenses, right? There is a significant amount of revenue that is going to offset a lot of this. Um, and so that'll show up when we talk about what folks' um, actual tax rates will be uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so what we're looking at, we're looking at an increase of about a million dollars in expenses for next year. Um, about half of it's due to new staff. Um, these are things to help support the ends and to help to support the work that we've got to do because of what became manifest under, under COVID. Um, we also have an increasing population in the elementary schools. Um, we've expanded the preschool program um, considerably. Um, we have full day preschool for four-year-olds and we are trying to expand the three-year-old um, programs as well in the coming years. And so um, there's, there's a lot that's going on there that we're trying to make sure that is supported. Um, half of the increase, half of that million dollar increase is for new staff. The other half is for what we call mandatory, mandatory things. We've got legal and contractual obligations under the, the staff master agreements um, that, that we have to make sure that we honor. Um, the other piece that we'll talk about a little bit, and you can see that on the, on the right column down at the bottom, um, that Special Education Act, that Act 173, that is changing how the state funds special education students. In our case, um, at least with the generic formulas they gave us to try to plan this budget, um, despite the fact that things may change in this coming legislative session, um, it hit us for $200,000. We, we're losing $200,000 in the support that we normally would have had from the state. Um, to support our, our special education students. And so we have to make that up somewhere um, because the, the need is still there even though the funding now is not. And so that's gonna come from the, from the Ed Fund now. Um, and so that's kind of the breakdown here. Um, so I kind of break this into discretionary and, and what I call mandatory. So the discretionary stuff is what's in purple, that's the new staff. It's like, yes, we could live without it, but um, there are significant needs that these uh, things will fulfill. We did whittle back from what our original asks were for, you know, when I did that first budget presentation two months ago. So OSSD discretionary, um, go through the details of this. One of the first things that is on there is the assistant superintendent, and um, that would be a full-time position. And basically, if we wanna be serious, um, about improving academics and programming for our students, uh, which is the general goal, um, collective goal of the ENDS, um, this position is essential. You know, we made the joke, um, kind of tongue in cheek at a previous board meeting, people said, well, what districts have these? And I said, well, the successful ones. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, main duties of uh, an assistant superintendent would center on curriculum development and implementation, student performance data analysis, student support systems, 
creating and implementing a K-12 staff professional development plan, grant management, and the most important piece, because all those pieces support each other, is tying those pieces together um, so that we have one cohesive learning program for the district K-12. And that's a big job um, for any one person. Um, they would also serve as the district's equity coordinator. Lane, can I ask a question? You sir, yeah, <clears throat> in, in, interrupt me anytime. Just in terms of the jobs market, yep. how difficult do you think it will be to fill that kind of? I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of experience, a lot of um, so special expertise. If we get the right person, you know, it'd be nice to have somebody who's got all the expertise coming in. If we get the right person um, who can learn, um, who can interact very positively and collaboratively with the teams that are already up and running and, and build the other teams that we need, we're going to be okay. I'm an expert in all those things. Um, one of the issues has been that I haven't had the time because I've got 220 some odd um, staff members I'm managing all human resources for. I've got the entire management of the district on top of it. I've been trying to do some of these pieces that are in this as I can, and it's just, it's too much. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of better if we can get that second body in here to cover that piece while I keep things running. But I can mentor and I can train. Um, I have actually developed these programs for scratch in, in two of the highest performing districts in the country. Um, mm -hmm. And I just need the time to sit down with somebody talk them through it um, and, and get them on their way. So it's not like I'm hands off in this. Right, right, yeah. I'm just... But, yeah. Um, just Mark and it would be done. nice to have somebody um, who has the skills, um, but if not, as long as they have what I call the traits. They got the behaviors, behaviors of mind, um, the characteristics of personality um, that, that are conducive to this. The other stuff can be trained easy enough. Um, okay. So. Um, and the other piece is that, you know, if we open up the position and we are not getting people, um, I'm not going to hire somebody until I get, get what we need. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll sit on it if I have to until the right person comes along. We potentially, no one has expressed an interest um, since we've talked about it, um, but there are potentially people within district who might be ideally suited for this. Oh. Um, and so I think you know we'll 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 see what the candidate pool looks like you know if the budget budget passes and, and this becomes a possibility. Uh, but but I, I think it's critical for for where we're at um, at, at this point in time if we want to you know take that step. Um, you see some preschool parts and pieces up up there. Um, you know the coordinator is to oversee the the part time three year old and the full time four year old programs as well as um, working to kind of expand the three year old programs. It's been Pat Miller. She kind of retired and then picked up um, part-time that we're paying her for now to get these programs up and running. She is exceptional. Um, she spent ages pouring through the myriad regulations that go along um, with programs for younger students, and they are legion. Um, and she's done an exceptional job. Uh, she's probably one of the best in the state, state now. Um, and we already have the teacher um, that is doing the work in the preschool program up at Brookfield. Um, it's just that they're being funded by grants. Um, and I'm trying to get them over into the regular budget so that we know they're there in, in, in perpetuity. Right? You know, the grants almost always come through, hasn't been a problem. Um, but administrations change, things happen. You know, I, I don't want to lose, lose this that we built because this is fundamental to a lot of the ends work. If we get that additional year, year and a half of education for students in those fundamental years, that's gonna be key to their success throughout the rest of the, their years within the district. Um, technical support specialist. Um, right now, you know, we're running a district of uh, 13, 1,013 or 31 students. Um, every one of them has a Chromebook, every teacher has a, a laptop. We have probably 50 or 60 different software um, platforms that we are running to support education within the school. It's not possible with the three. How the heck they've done it for the last couple of years, I don't know. Um, but uh, we're looking to bring on a, a, a fourth person um, to be a part of that, uh, that program. 
um, there's two pieces to this. Um, the main piece is that we're in a position where we need to start looking at a, a, a new website. We need to bring that platform in-house so that we can manage it here um, with our own expertise, add what we need um, and whatnot. And so this person's primary responsibility would be that, and then the time that they have left over, they can support you know, the other three techs that we have within the building. The other piece that I am hoping um, is that you know Tina um, was actually brought in originally not as a tech director, but as an integration specialist. In other words, someone who takes the technology that's out there and matches it with the needs of the teachers and the students so that it can be used to enhance their learning. And I think if we can free her up, because she really does enjoy working with kids. I didn't realize she was a music teacher at one time. Uh, she's been driving the robotics. I had her. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> she's been driving the robotics work that's, that's been happening around here to a great extent. Um, to be able to free her up to do a little bit of that would also be incredibly beneficial to the students. Um, the librarian time um, is, is primarily at Braintree and Brookfield. They are each in there just one day a week. It's trying to get them in for two. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, the first is that um, you know, they are the primary deliverers of the digital literacy curriculum and they need more time to do that because we did start doing some work on developing a digital liter literacy curriculum, but they don't have the time to deliver it um, in the way that it needs to be done. They also, um, kind of like Tina is an integration specialist, they work with the academic teachers. Um, if the teachers are working on projects and things, these are resources that they can go to that can help them identify the materials um, they need and some of the technology they need that's going to be useful to what the teachers are trying to accomplish. And the last piece that I think is most important given, and this is more a little bit more COVID related, um, is the elementary schools um, are a little bit different animal, obviously, than the high school. Uh, they don't get the planning time that the high school teachers get. And so anything that we can do to give them a little bit more planning time, a little bit more team time, where they can connect around the needs of their students and adapt to that, um, the better off everybody is going to be. And so while the librarians have the students, that's going to free up the elementary teachers to be able to do that, that work that's so necessary. So a lot of that is a support um, for the support for the other teachers and the students by, by, by providing the extra time. In terms of a classroom teacher, uh, RES, actually I got my numbers here, uh, RES is actually at a six year high in terms of its enrollment right now. Matter of fact, our elementary schools are at a six year high in terms of their enrollments um, as a total, uh, with most of those new enrollments in grades K to four. And they're at a point where they're bursting at the seams. They need a new teacher because the classes are just getting too large. Um, uh, the nurse, the nurse is already here. This is shifting her off a of grant um, and into the regular budget because we need the additional support um, at the high school and RTCC. That's been kind of ongoing since COVID has been there. We have no idea how much longer COVID's going to last. Uh, it, I have a feeling it's it's with us forever. You know what state or what form it will be in, I don't know. And so being able to have that extra um, medical person on hand who can help with testing and everything else has been incredibly beneficial. Um, and to support that, and then a math teacher at uh, Randolph Union, um, they have done some pretty significant curriculum revamps and um, curriculum rewrites and working together as a team. Uh, but probably one of the, the things they need the most right now um, is just an additional teacher to reduce the class sizes um, so that they can spend a little bit more concentrated time with the students as the class sizes go, go down to a certain point, um, learning will increase. Um, and so that's kind of the goal of that position. So these are the discretionary uh, pieces that we're adding that that half half of that million dollar increase. So I'll shut up for a little while in case there's questions. questions? And you guys are up to speed on a lot of this stuff because we've talked about it, but a lot of this is also for folks that will be watching on on cable the next next week or two. Um, all right, local taxes. What, what, what we're all paying for our tax rates. It's important to recognize 
that taxes at the local level come from two different sources. One of those sources is under the school's control, one of them is not. Right? And most people are familiar, who've lived in Vermont for a little while, what these things are. The things that are controlled by the district um, is basically how much the schools are spending to do their job relative to their, the revenues we receive. Right? That's within our control. What's not in our control is this common level of appraisal. Um, what happens uh, in the state, um, and it's built into the tax formula, is if the values of homes in your town have gone up over the past year, then this common level of appraisal, the CLA, will change so that you are paying more in taxes. Makes sense. If the value of your home goes up, then the state feels that you should be paying more in taxes because that value has gone up. Um, the CLA has, has to do with the changes in the value of real estate in the town. It has nothing to do with the schools and what we are spending. Now, this is important. If your tax rate were only based on the school side of the equation, your rates next year would go down by about seven cents per hundred dollars of assessed value, or about $200 for the year for an average price just the school. So we've done our job, but that should give you an indication that there's a lot of revenues that came in to offset that million. This slide takes both elements into account. Um, you've got the school impact and the CLA impact, and it provides what next year's tax rates would be in each town if this budget is, in, is approved. If you're living in Braintree, um, you would see on an average home, so an average home this year is $281,000 in this area. So on an average home, you would see a decrease in your annual taxes of $216. In Brookfield, you would see an annual decrease in your taxes of $9. In Randolph, because our property values went up the most of the three towns in the last year, you would actually see an annual increase of $82. questions on the, yeah, you know, when, you're, when you're paying 4000 5000 already, you know, it's, it's hor horrible to add more, but by the same token, relative to the four or five, it's not, not a lot. Um, and it'll probably change next year when the CLA changes again. But the CLA has had a, has a, had a, has had a big impact on, on um, what the tax rates are. So questions on tax rates and Yeah, and I'm I talk about it in fairly simplistic terms because Vermont has one of the most complicated formulas that I've ever seen. I almost think it should be unconstitutional if a person with an average education can't, you know, calculate what their taxes should be based upon the state tax formula. There's a problem there. But, all right, so move on to the next thing that we're going to consider here, um, and things that you have to vote on, and will be a part of the warning uh, potentially that the towns folks will vote on in March. Um, there is surplus and there is re reserve. Um, surplus, those are monies that remained at the end of a budget year. So, right, we're in, the, in a current budget year right now at the end of the year. If there is money left over, that is called surplus. If we have surplus and we can convince the voters um, to put that surplus into a reserve fund for us, we can then later use that money for the purpose that they allowed us to put the money in the fund for. So right, transportation fund means if they approve money for the transportation fund, that we will be spending it on replacing buses and other vehicles in and around the district. All right. um, a couple of things, this conversation can get a little confusing because we're actually potentially talking about three different fiscal years. Surplus comes from last year. Right? It's what's left over at the end of the last year's budget. We are in the middle of managing this year's budget, right? So it's keeping us up and running, and we talk about it in various aspects of the meetings. And then you are in the process of voting on next year's budget. So I'll try to keep, um, keep things a little bit separate. The big thing about um, surplus monies is if the town votes to move them into a reserve fund, um, this is where the board would have to vote to allow the district to access that money. And that's something that at the very beginning, right, we were talking about the buses and we were talking about the lead. Um, 
that is part of your oversight duty. That's why you vote on it, because we guaranteed to the town we would be using it for these specific purposes. Your job is to make sure that the district does that, and that's what that vote accomplishes. So, 2020-21, so this was last year. And last year was the ESSER 1 um, federal grant monies that came in. They had weird rules with it um, that allowed us to do things that you normally can't do with federal funding. And one of the things that allowed us to do was to supplant. In other words, if we were spending money already on something, we were also allowed now to apply grant money to it. In other years, you're not allowed to do that. Typically, if you're spending grant money, it's for things that are above and beyond what you can do on your own. And so the directive kind of came down from the state is, take this ESSER 1 money, spend it on your needs for mitigating COVID, but then if you have money that's left over above and beyond on that, spend it on your normal, and that's what we did. And in doing that, right, we still had to, we still had to ask for all the money that we needed for the year up front, because the grants are reimbursement grants. You have to have it and spend it first before you get it back. So now we're at the end of this year, and we've got $2,072,997 in surplus that are sitting there, which is awesome, because we can do a lot of things with that. And so my recommendations for this, and there's two of them, is that we do what we did last year, and I'll show, show you how this, this looks, is that we take a million of that $2 million, and we use it to lessen the tax burden um, on the taxpayers. So we take a million of those dollars, we divide it up into three equal amounts of money. The first will help folks for um, next year. The next chunk will help folks for the year after that. The next chunk will help folks for the year after that. And so that's my suggestion, is to help subsidize things, help ease the burden on taxpayers for the next um, couple of years. Now, there are some foreseeable things, and a couple of them are a little bit scary that are coming up, um, that makes it kind of uh, uh, an imperative to put some of this money into our reserve funds. And I'll talk about what each of those things are when we hit them. Um, so a couple of things to kind of remember. So we had surplus from the year before last. And remember what we did, it was like 1.6 million. So we made a, a decision at that point in time. We said, heck, you know, everything is unknown in terms of COVID. We don't know what's gonna be happening with the education fund. Um, and so let's plan on trying to help the taxpayers out as much as we can. And so what we decided that, that two years ago um, was that that 1.6 million, we were gonna use half of it up front, right? And this year that we're currently in to subsidize taxes, to lower, lower the taxes that people would have to pay. And then we'll take the second half, divide it into two equal sums, and use that in the following two years to help folks out. So what I'm proposing for this year is that we take that million dollars, divide it into three equal amounts, also use that to subsidize. And so what you'll see is that this year we subsidized, we helped out the taxpayers by, by generating $826,000 in revenue to offset taxes. Next year it'll be $746,000, the year after that $746,000. I'm calling this uh, $333,000 right now, but the odds are we'll have another lump of uh, surplus because of all the federal money in ESSER 3 that we're going to have to spend now um, that we'll be able to do this again. And there's a couple of reasons to try to spread it out over three years instead of doing it all at once. If we do it all at once, we don't know what's gonna happen in those future two, two years and we know that COVID is still with us. We don't know if the economy is gonna crash, it's gonna be strong or what. And so this allows us a, a way of buffering things. The other thing it does is it doesn't set us up for a cliff, right? We spend it all up front, all of a sudden the next year it's like, hey, if we still want to do everything that we've been doing, we might have to ask if the Ed Fund doesn't increase the way that we hope it does, we might have to ask the taxpayers for a whole bunch of money to keep us where we're at. And so what you'll see what this does is this kind of gets things to a steady level. And if the Ed Fund starts to increase, we slowly wean off this as the Ed Fund goes up and hopefully everything is balanced and there's no cliff that we have to deal with in terms of the budget. If I'm making any sense, a little bit. 
And so this is what I am recommending um, for the plan. I think it's a good one, and I think the taxpayers have helped us out an awful lot. And this is going to help us keep um, taxes as low as possible while we're still building, adding, and creating uh, what we need to reach the ends. So questions on the, the subsidization piece? Is there any concern that the state might come in and say, hey, you've got this big subsidy? They, it, it or was a big surplus, you know, you should give it back to us. Yeah, it, there was the first couple of years. There was actually discussion about it one year, but it was side discussion. Um, I checked with Pietro. Um, his feeling is under the law they couldn't, even if they wanted to. Okay. Um, and so I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, a part of it is that, you know, we voted in good faith for this money. Um, the, the voters voted in good faith to put into the, these reserve funds for these specific purposes, and they followed the law to do that. So that would take a huge, huge act, and they, the amount of political fallout they would receive would be tremendous um, for this. But yeah, no, it was, a, it was a real concern my first two years here as I was, I was trying to understand the budget process. So we'll talk a little bit about this, about where, where things currently stand um, in terms of, you know, per student spending. Um, total budget, including grants, remember, we have to say everything that we're spending, so that includes our grant monies. Um, those don't come from the taxpayers, but because we're spending it and they're voting on our expenses, we have to include it as part of the budget. So $22,165,294. Um, the plan is to use 746503 um, in surplus. Some from, you know, this year's surplus from some from the reserve fund to offset the budget. Um, this keeps us below the spe spending threshold and it provides a $418 per student buffer. So right now, the property yields, they did really well um, in terms of the education fund. Uh, the property yields are up over $1,000, you know, $12,937 per student. When I started here, it was down around 10000 so it's gone up significantly over the time. And so the property yields, the, the dirty way to think about it is this is how much you're getting from the state per student. Okay, so it's gone, gone up by about $1,000 per student since last year. Right now, our cost per student with this budget is $19,559. Um, and taking a look at uh, what these numbers are for other districts around the state in previous years, where we stood next to them in previous years, um, we're in the middle of the pack. We're not at the top, we're not at the bottom. We're, if this is the middle, we're like we're right about here. So we're, we're, we're not, not out of line. There is a threshold. This threshold has been waived um, for this year, but they did put a number out there of what it would be if it didn't count. What happens with this threshold is if your spending goes above that, there's penalties and all the money comes from local. Whereas the money underneath here comes from the Ed Fund, which means all the taxpayers in the state are, 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 are paying into it. Um, so it's kind of an interesting system. So we're in, in really good stead. You know, technically, you know, if we were really trying to leverage stuff and, and the, the, the town was on board, you know, the best thing to do is to push as close to that darn threshold as you can get without going across it each year. Right, because it's kind of other people's money. Some of ours, but a lot of it's coming from taxpayers across the state. So questions, thoughts on this before we move into reserve funds? And I apologize, but there's a lot of pieces here that you guys are voting on. I want to make sure that. I'm curious, have you have you looked back to see sort of our per people spending over time? Do you keep that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's and again, it's quirky because it depends on the year, depends on enrollments, it can change quite yeah. a bit. It's been between 17, Actually, last, and then two, there's inflation last two years we were pretty too, stable. Right? It was it was 17 something, uh, but it was close to 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think you're going to see this is the case. What you see happening with us, you're going to see this across the state because we're all in the same boat. Um, you know, and that was one of the reasons I think there was a lot of concern that a lot of people would be actually over that threshold this year, which is why they waived it. Right? They don't usually do that. It's the first time I've, I've heard of them doing that. So. The other piece is, so we, we've got this million, we're going to want to use that to, to subsidize, um, subsidize the, the, the budget so the taxpayers aren't paying as much. Um, but we've got this other half a million, and this is how I'm recommending that we break it down. 
Um, in terms of the vehicle and the bus reserve fund, so I call that the transportation fund. We use it to replace uh, buses, vehicles, whatever is, is wearing out. Uh, we currently have over a million dollars in there. We have 100000 that we budget every year anyway um, within the normal regular budget that supports this. So our average spending each year is about $100,000. We don't really need to add more to this at this point in time. Building and maintenance is, is fairly high, right? It's 2.8 million that's in there right now. But there's a reason for that. If we get any huge projects that come our way, we don't have to go out to bid. We don't have to ask the town to take a loan or the district to take a loan to go out and get this work done because we've already got the money. We had enough money to replace the, you know, the building on the roof on this school you know, last year when the time came without ever having to go and ask, ask the town for it. But I'm going to recommend that we add a half a million um, to that fund. And the reason being is because we have a great unknown out there right now. And in addition to the lead testing that folks were required to do, we were also required to do PCB testing. So that came out of the last legislative session. So the reality is, is that any building that is older than 1979 or has parts of it that are older than 1979 is almost assured to have PCBs in them because they were ubiquitous. They're an insulator. They're used for electrical and thermal insulation and everything else, uh, right down to the caulking that was used in windows. Um, and so the odds are that we are going to encounter some PCB issues when the testing happens. Can't guarantee it, but it, it, it's likely and we're gonna to need to remediate. And so I'm thinking it's important to put in um, a significant amount of money to be able to cover that um, if and when that time comes. Legal fund, um, we had $42,000 that have been sitting there for a number of years. I'm suggesting putting in another 48,000. Uh, one of the reasons being is, uh, as we talked about, you know, are we gonna be able to find a qualified candidate for assistant superintendent? Um, I expect with the exodus that seems to be happening right now in personnel trying to get out of the education profession, um, I think people are tired. I think the burned out that's happening across the nation. I think they're realizing that, um, you know, having to encounter COVID every day, um, coming into the buildings and having to work in a congregate setting during COVID is not where a lot of folks want to be. Um, and so I think there's going to be an exodus. And so what that means is the quality of applicants that we are going to get, the pool of applicants that are out there is going to go down. And typically when the quality goes down, you end up with many more human resources issues than you normally would. And a lot of human resources issues need to be cleaned up with, with help from um, you know, the district's legal counsel. And so just in anticipation of that possibility, I think it's wise to put a little bit of, of money in there. Um, the special education fund, um, we actually created this uh, probably about two years ago in anticipation of this eventual switch to uh, the block branded funding under Act 173. Right, it used to be we get, we get a kid that comes in and when we got him in we knew the state was going to reimburse us for part of the expenses of that student. What the new system is is that they basically look at the population of your school and say based upon you know the 850 kids that you have that actually live in your three towns, um, you get a lump sum of money here, you need to make it last. Um, problem is, you get that lump sum of money up front, what happens if I get a kid that comes in in the middle of the year, which often happens, it, it's costing me $300,000 um, between the, the services that we send them out to and the transportation. I've got to be able to cover it without decimating the budget. And so we've been building um, a special education reserve fund for those scenarios. You know, if we have, if we have you know, two or three kids work in with severe needs, I don't have to decimate the rest of the budget to be able to provide that. They do have um, what's called, I call it circuit breaker. That used to be the federal name for it. Um, they do still reimburse for some students that are very high, but you got to pay this much of it and then they'll reimburse you for you know, the top, the, the top portion of it. So there is some reimbursement, there is some circuit breaker help if needed, but not what folks are used to. And so I think we got a plan for it. And so that's the reason for, for that. And like I said, as you already saw, you know, even on this, this uh, switch that they, they, they put the formula they gave us to use, while things are still a little bit up in the air, we lost $200,000. 
you know, our, our right. Um, this uh, operational fund, um, this one's a little quirky, so I may want to I may want to actually go back to my notes to make sure that I, I state all the parts and pieces right. Um, this is where we put the money that we use to subsidize the budget in later years. Right? That's its purpose. Um, and so there's the 826000 there. That's what's left over from last year, right? We're going to split it into two chunks use it over the next two years. So I'm suggesting that we put 916666 uh, in there uh, as well. Um, and that number seems a bit high. It may not make a little bit of sense, but let me explain it, right? So we talked about that first million that had nothing to do with the reserve funds. A third of it is going to subsidize next year. That's already there. We can do that. We don't need anybody to approve us to do that. The 666000 that's left over needs a place to sit so that we can use it in the next tax years to subsidize taxes. So 666000 of that is from that original million that's separate from what we talked about for the reserve funds that's just sitting in here so that we have it available when the time comes to subsidize taxes. With. The remaining 250000 above that that I'm asking to put in there um, is for three things. And again, anticipating the future here, um, which is what a lot of this financial planning executive limitation is about, is because of the failure of the financial software uh, to launch that the state was trying to put into place. Um, they had, uh, under the law, um, they were required to put in a statewide financial software system that all districts would use. Um, because it makes the transfer of data between the state systems and the school systems um, much easier. They can just pull what they need because everything's in the same place when the computers are looking for it. Uh, that failure was, that, that software was a dramatic failure. Uh, it was supposed to go into place in our district four years ago. They've been hemming and hawing trying to decide what, what to do about it. Uh, they signed a contract for it, um, and so they're in the process of breaking the contract. And we don't know what the outcome is going to be. My guess is, is that they're going to turn around and say, districts do what you want as long as it communicates with the state, the state systems, which means that they were going to pay for the software for everybody, but it may end up back in our laps. And so that transition for our district alone is in the $150,000 range. So $250,000 going in there, $150,000 of it is to make sure that we are potentially covering if we've got a eat the cost on, on a new financial software package. Um, the other portion, the money that remains, um, would go towards creating a new um, website and creating it on an in-house platform that we control right here. And then the other piece that's um, <laughs> becoming vitally important is we need uh, an archival database that can digitize all our paper records. Everything this district does almost is done in paper. I have classrooms at the high school that we cannot use because they are filled with file cabinets of 65 years of student records that we have to maintain. Employment records, a lot of parts and pieces of them have to be maintained forever. Financial records have to be maintained for at least seven years. We have whole areas of buildings in paper um, that are, you know, that are these records. And the best thing that we could possibly do is get it digitized, get it into a database so that anybody can do a Boolean search on it and pull up what they need when they need it, and then to claim back that space for other purposes. Um, and so part of that money would be used to begin that investigation and see what kind of a package that we can bring in to do that. So, Throw a whole lot at you, questions on reserve fund and the logic behind why, what, what's going where. Do we have any hands? People are here, do you? People, pe people are running here? around trying to get their caffeine so they can stay away from your <laughs> Don't blame them. And then the last thing um, that folks, you know, you'll be voting on uh, potentially tonight or what we call announced tuitions. 
um, the board is required to announce tuitions to vote on, on what they will be for students that um, come to our district. Um, for Raven, we've already talked about that. That would be the 25241. For the Tech Center, that's the, the, the what we already talked about, the 18670. At the elementary level, if they're coming and attending our elementary schools from outside, it would be 15670. Actually, here's your, here's your listing of what it's been. Um, and at RUHS, it would be 18 609. Uh, again, you know, school school choice and uh, tuition and students. This this is what the cost would be. Um, it is not we nothing in there is padded. It is based upon what we would be paying for our own yeah. own students. So I don't know if there's questions on that. Um, we currently actually do very well. Um, in terms of the students that are coming in from the outside, we're generating 350,000 a year in revenue for students that are choosing to come here over other districts. Um, so we're doing, doing a pretty good job. The end. <laughs> Unless there's questions, I can go back to anything. Um, Well, that was a lot of information to digest, but it sounds like you've, you've put together, you, you've got pretty strong rationales for, for what you're doing and why you're doing it. And it doesn't seem like it's going to be a huge It's actually the smallest in all the years we've, I've been here anyway. Yeah. Randolph was usually... Randolph was interesting every year. Randolph was usually the CLA was right what the town assessments were. You know, they were they were usually right, so there wasn't a big fluctuation up and down in terms of CLAs. And they finally got hit this year. Um, it was usually Brookfield and Braintree that were always swinging up and down every year. The tax rates. Okay. Do we have any questions for Lane regarding the budget? Anybody online have any questions? Our public participant? Okay. Um, then I think we will move on. So we do we have to we have to vote to approve the warning, right? Add to in the budget, right? In the budget. Yeah, some of it's actually in the consent agenda. Let's see. So you, you would need to do two separate votes right now. Um, one for the OSSD budget, one for the Raven budget, and one for the RTCC budget. Okay. It's with the budget. Okay. So, okay. So we, we need, do we need, and we need to do that during this portion of the meeting, yeah. or do we do no. that in the consent right. agenda the section? Reserve funds and stuff are in the... Consent, consent agenda. agenda. Okay, so we're going to be doing the budget. So, the, um, and I need someone to give me a motion. I move we accept the we approve the OSSD. This is Hannah budget uh, and OSSD warning as in, uh, enclosed with our materials and presented. Is that nice? Mm -hmm. I second. I'm Ashley. Okay, and uh, is there any discussion? So all those in favor of accepting the motion to accept the budget? Aye. Aye. Okay. So there is our OSD budget and warning. And then can I have a motion for the Raven? I will make the motion that we approve the Raven budget and um, warning as submitted in our packet. To Brian. And do we have a second? Megan will second. Megan is going to second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. And then we need to also approve the RTCC budget. I make a motion that we approve the RTCC budget as presented. This is Ashley. 
Do I have a second? Hannah seconds. Hannah's going to second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, so next on the agenda is the um, financial reports. So we're so the no November one is bit. there. Um, the December one, she literally just completed. Oh, are we in? Oh, oh. Nope. No, sorry, I'm I I missed. We haven't yet stopped, talked about the uh, COVID oh. operating plan. Mm -hmm. That was a fun one this time around. Um, so uh, near the end of vacation, um, uh, the state directed districts used the, the Vermont Department of Health's guidance um, that was based on the updated CDC changes. So we revamped the COVID manual, got that out to the community, talked a little bit about it. Um, it really it changed basically two of the protocols. Um, the first that it changed was the, the protocols for what to do for close contacts. Um, if you're vaccinated and without symptoms, um, you don't need to quarantine. That's That's been the case. Um, you've got to wear a mask and you should get tested on day five. If you're unvaccinated um, or outside the booster window, so in other words, if um, you had the Johnson & Johnson more than two months ago and haven't been boosted or you had one of the uh, mRNI, mRNA, excuse me, vaccines within the last more than six months ago and haven't been boosted, then you fall into this category. Um, you must stay home and quarantine for five days. Um, folks can leave home on day five if they have no symptoms, have a negative PCR test after day four, or two negative rapid tests, um, and uh, if they wear a mask for the next five days afterwards. And so this is all in the handbook. It's easier, easier to read it because folks, folks won't remember it. Um, what was also interesting was they put the burden of um, close contacts if it happened outside of school on the people that I, on the people that uh, potentially were case zero. So in other words, if I found out that I tested positive, then now becomes my job to call all the people that I was in close contact with and notify them. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, for those that test positive, um, and this is the one that was in the news a lot the last couple of days, um, if they test positive for COVID, they must stay home for five days and away from family members. Um, they may leave home on day five if they are no longer symptomatic and if they wear a mask through day 10. And they did add a little bit more guidance about that, and this is one of the questions that the schools had, because the guidance that came out was kind of for the community, it wasn't school specific. Um, was this idea that, well, if you got to wear the mask through day 10 and you're never supposed to take it off, how do we manage kids eating in the cafeteria? You know, who might be on, if we got 60 kids, you know, it's one thing to have one kid eat in isolation, but you got 60 kids that are in this category. We don't have that kind of space. And so that's something that we're still waiting for kind of clarity on. Um, but those are the, the, the big changes. And again, those have been communicated to the community um, really after they came out. The community's been quiet. Um, case rates too, since we're on it right now, um, I probably should check my email. I'm probably going to curse things by saying this, but we have um, a couple of the staff out in the, at the after school program um, at one of the small schools, and we had one student um, today, and that's it so far. Um, we're still waiting for Tuesday's surveillance testing to come back. Um, what they've been finding at the other schools who tested on Monday was that when the surveillance testing came back, they had a whole bunch of asymptomatic individuals running around. Um, in some cases, as much as like 30% of, of those that got, got the surveillance testing, but they're all asymptomatic. So it's just, it's kind of an interesting change to things as we've been experiencing. I don't know if there's other questions on COVID. Okay. Now we'll move on to the monthly financials. So the November is in there. Um, and like I said, it when um, we changed the 
when the board meetings were occurring, um, lots of times they're kind of early in the month, and so they, because they're closing out a month, it takes some time. So you may have a month lag between when you get them, but this is the November. Um, she did get the, the December data done, but it was literally just before the meeting. Matter of fact, we got the final data for calculating the budget and the tax rates, you know, just a day or two ago. So, you know, accommodations out to Robin for helping um, scramble around and figure all those parts and pieces out here. Um, the one of the ones that's interesting on there uh, is under you know the food service is always one that's a question with the board. Um, it's saying it's ninety six thousand in the whole. It's actually not. Um, the reimbursements that we get from the state because it's a federally managed program, um, you know, can't come in sporadically. We are actually in the black for the first time. Um, we are above and above. Um, we've got more money coming in than we're spending on it, and that's never happened. Um, so we're in really good shape there. Um, you'll see that the technology on the expense side is low. Um, the reason that that is is uh, because we purchased a lot of computers and we tried to maintain a lot of the new software packages that we put into place to help out with the remote sessions last year. Um, and we're waiting for grant reimbursements for those things. So, you know, we spent the money up front, so we kind of overspent the accounts, but we've got the E-rate um, money that should be coming in and ESSER money that will cover it as, as part of reimbursements. Um, the percentage, just so that you know, it's showing 400% uh, there. Um, it's a calculation area in that box. Um, it's actually 61%, which is actually really good. And then again, the general rule of thumb, if you got 12 months in a year um, and everything is linear, and it, it primarily is, except for a couple of the summer months, we should be spending about 8.3% of the overall budget each month, um, which means that uh, at the end of November, which is the form that you're looking at, we should have spent about 58% of the overall budget. We actually have only still have 67% um, left, so we're, we're well in the black um, at this point. In time. And again, I expect as uh, re more reimbursements come in, especially under the SR2 funding um, that's kind of controlling this year, is that we will probably have a hefty surplus again at the end of next year. What is your time frame normally on those reimbursements? Uh, it depends. Um, you know, like the title funding, you know, you spend it, you put the, you put in the request for what you spent, you get it monthly. Um, sometimes it's quarterly. Um, these have pretty much kind of been, a lot of them have been monthly um, lately, which has been good. It's not bad. Yeah, no, the, the reimbursements on the food food stuff is sporadic. I think that's more our, our fault. I think it takes them a long time to get through the receipts. And actually do the submissions. Um, I think that's that's more the reason. It's like more our fault than, than than the states. But they do a pretty good job. So it sounds like you're confident in where we are. You know, oh yeah, no, quite quite happy. Uh, so we're going to move on to the next. Uh, policy decisions for our board governance and uh, we need to have a budget information meeting and we need to set that date and if I remember correctly 10 days, yeah, before, 10 days before the vote the yeah, vote within the 10 day window it always falls during February it's always during February break okay so how do we want to um, make that date Usually you want to do a recommendation Linda yeah, well, I don't have my calendar with me. Pull out and pull mine out. I don't know. Whatever night that, uh, I guess, I whatever night during tonight. that week you guys want to. I can find through the calendar. Right? I think it's usually like a Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday. Yeah, there's a basketball game on Thursday night. So. Okay, so we'll avoid that one. I don't know if the girls, when the girls play, but the boys have a basketball game that night. It's February break. And we're, we usually do it in one location, and anybody from each of yeah. the towns can Cation come. Since we consolidated. Right. February. What's, what's, what's voting day this, this year, March? March. So Second. March 1st is town meeting. Now will be the budget vote. Gotcha. So it's got to be within 10 days, so oh. could be... Probably that week of the 21st through the 25th. Yeah. 
that yellow week on there? So the 22nd, is that Tuesday? 22nd is Tuesday. You guys get to decide this one. So. Doesn't matter to me. Vacation will be. I won't have a lot of phone, so I have no idea. <laughs> My schedule is. So I, I think I'll be all right. So somebody have, want to make a proposal? I make a motion or that we have our budget um, hearing for voters on Tuesday, February 22nd um, at the RUHS auditorium, correct? Um, yeah, this could be in the media center or whatever. Okay. We have our center. annual meeting yeah. in the odd. Yeah, so. At RUHS, okay. Yeah, and then depending, of course, with COVID, we haven't had a lot of folks, but, you know, the early years before COVID, it was usually right in the auditorium. Sometimes it conflicts with plays, but with COVID, that's not as... Strange. I can try for the odd if you want. I mean, will you do a PowerPoint that would be... Uh, yeah, I don't necessarily have to, but I've been, been doing it just because mm -hmm. of the people that well, show you up. You can do that at the odd, right? Yeah, and it might be, given March, you know, if we've got a surge with this Omicron, I mean, if it, if it passes in February, like a lot of folks are predicting, there might be people that are quite happy to show up in the spring. If it's in the odd. Okay. So let's do the auditorium just so people yep. can spread out. And what time, guys? You want to do like 6 o'clock or? Sure. 6? We'll say okay. 6 p.m. Okay, any other proposals? Any discussion? So, S second. so we okay, need a Brian second. <laughs> okay. So seconded by Brian. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. So we've set that date. And you have all the details. Yep. Okay. Uh, so next up on the agenda is um, some uh, district governance and um, Lane, if you can start us off with just um, yeah, I'm throwing a tough one at you. <laughs> uh, just sort yeah. of what you're looking for and maybe a little bit about why you're asking us to do this. Yeah, so I, I talked with. Um, Talked with with Pietro um, a little bit and kind of looking at what's happening in the world on the legal front and part of the executive limita limitations kind of they put me in a position that I've got this responsibility it's the right position to put me in um, to protect the district from foreseeable events and so I think after talking with Pietro I'm concerned uh, that without a specific policy that reserves the right of the district to choose which flag it will fly. We are leaving open the possibility that we will have to accept all requests for flags that folks want to fly. So this is not, this is about um, potentially creating a policy. And it, you, there's lots of ways to do it, but my recommendation with potentially Pietro helping in the wording is it's a policy that puts the power of the hands to make the decision in the hands of the district, in the hands in the hands of the board. You can put it in my hands. I don't care which. But as long as there's a policy on there that says who has the power, we're protected. If it's left wide open, if there's no policy that governs it, then technically, um, to a certain extent, that those flagpoles then become an open forum for anybody who wants to post on them. Um, and so we want to be able to have um, some reasonable control over that and the way to protect us, ourselves from getting sued if we say no to some, some groups and yes to others is to say, hey, um, nope, we have a very secure policy that was voted in um, through the proper channels that describes, you know, the authority rests with us and may even describe, you know, some of the processes that we use to make those determinations. And so this isn't meant to create a policy here and now. It's a meant for me to kind of air, you know, after talking with Pietro and doing some thinking, um, the fact that there is a, you know, potential foreseeable event out there that we might be able to mitigate if, if we have this policy in place um, down the line. 
if I'm making sense, and trying to be politically well spoken as I present. So, are there questions for Lane in terms of? So, and uh, Katya and I also had a conversation with Pietro, and uh, my understanding from what he he said too is right now we don't have a policy. We've basically, um, uh, it was either last year or the year before, sort of pushed it over to the administration to decide. Um, and without the district taking the way the law is, from what P Pietro was saying, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm trying to, un I would, we asked him a fair number of questions to sort of understand it. But without the, the district as the governing body, and the, we, are, we sort of are the government, we can have that ability to, to decide what flags are going to fly. Um, whereas pushing it over to the administration and then having, having Lane figure out or sort of have a, a, a different ideas about how to decide who is he's he's sort of left without a lot of guidance um, and the issue has been coming up i guess in other districts also where um, it's making that flagpole become a public forum and therefore you run into freedom of speech issues where you have to make sure that everyone has um, access if you're going to make the flagpole a, a public forum. Yeah. And so that's kind of the thoughts. And there were, I did a little research, there are a couple of districts out there, Colchester being notably, um, you know, they do have, have flag policies um, out there that guide their decisions. I mean, they are, they are flying flags, um, but they have the ability be, because of their policy to say no and be protected when they do. Um, and so I just think it might be a, a, a wise um, thing to pursue. Um, the other piece that's a little more philosophical, I guess, is, um, you know, I was looking around, you know, the decisions, you know, that have been made. Most of these decisions potentially are highly controversial. And what makes a decision controversial is the fact that it can be reasonably argued from both sides. And so, you know, when I was looking at, it was it EL 2.0 and 2.4, I think it was, or 2.1? You know, the two, the global constraints, and then the um, treatment of, you know, I could make an equal argument on both sides of the Black Lives Matter flag, for example, um, that would meet the reasonableness clause, but yet both can't be right in terms of the intent of the board as the governing body. And so it kind of, in a way, I, I don't have enough guidance in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the decisions that was made for myself, and I can justify it re and the reasonableness that I would have to do under those policies, but I could have easily have gone the other way and justified it as reasonable to say no. And so there's not enough guidance there for me to say, okay, in terms of the board's intent as the governing body, what should I do? Or what, what should I do? So, it, and again, this is a kind of a little bit separate conversation, but I, what I'm saying is I don't have enough, it's not specific enough, you know, you got a really general policy there that can be interpreted in a million ways reasonably. Maybe this one needs to be a little bit more specific, and maybe that this piece will help with that. I don't know. So, so what you're asking for the bo for the board to decide is: uh, do we even want to investigate? Is this? do we want to look into creating a flag policy yeah. um, as a board? Am I permitted to ask a question? Sure. Or make a comment, or sure. does it have to be a question? I think. I think, well, you can, you, the, I got to look at the, excuse me, one minute. Um, I think our procedure is that if we are going to vote on something, um, we can have you um, provide, um, yeah. In addition, the chair will ask for comments on agenda items before action is taken by the board. Um, so at this point we aren't gonna we aren't gonna take it.
Uh, well, do we have we to have make an action to to investigate it or uh, to proceed? I, I would I it? would say what? yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if if you want want to, or you could table it until let's think about it for a month and let's table it until the next meeting and then you can also add a you know public comment. Public comment. Um, piece. That's another possibility. Yeah. This is actually my public comment for next time I come next month. But anyway. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so what you're asking for us to do now then is to decide if we want to have, if we want to go down the road. Pursue the possibility. Not, not, you're not saying you're going to necessarily do it. You want to see what a possible policy or what possible policies could be and, and just investigate it is what I would argue at this okay. point. Can I, can I just interrupt for a second? Sure. I have to leave because there's some kind of emergency just down the road a little ways. So I apologize for that. And I will try to get filled in if that's a thing that can happen um, in the next week or so. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> I hope everything's okay. Yeah. So does the board want to want to make a motion to or have some discussion about whether or not we want to well if we are going to make a motion don't, yeah. then we would, then we right. would have our yeah. our public make their comment right. yes um but i'm wondering what the board would like to do at this point do we want to and do we want to discuss i mean i don't, I don't think it's more, a, would be a or? problem to have it you know to at least have them give us some examples of what a policy would look like and then we can make that decision you know next month or whatever if we really want to enact policy or you know kind of finalize it but I don't see a problem with doing it this way mm -hmm. it seems like given what we've heard it would be kind of foolish not to look into it at least Katya, you you've been looking into it at the with the library board, right? Or not maybe not the but a similar type of issue, right? Um I mean not not directly, just the whole freedom of speech um for, like surrounding freedom of speech in public places. But I agree with Rachel that um you know, exploring it as an option is is definitely worthwhile. Any any other discussion? Do we want to hear, want to hear uh, him now? Hear or for, after yeah, we make I, I, okay. I think we ought to go ahead. Yeah, if there's the, no more the discussion chair, from, right recognize. Yep. from other board members, let's hear from our. So I guess my question would be: Would the would the superintendent of the board allow me to fly a Gadsden flag uh, and alternate months of putting it above and below the Black Lives Matter flag? The Gadsden flag is right there. Don't tread on me, flag. Oh, oh, don't tread on me. So I would. And, and I, my comment, I guess, on this would be this is like nativity scenes that towns have dealt with for a long time. Um, and towns that allow nativity scenes also are allowing now satanic whatever they put up. Um, and this is the problem you face. And I don't know that you as a board setting a policy that you're in control of it helps you any when it comes to that lawsuit, to be quite honest. Because that freedom of speech is, is always going to be there no matter who makes the decision. So my recommendation to the board would be to not allow any flags other than the U.S. and the state flag on public buildings. You just, you are opening such a can of worms for yourself by allowing not just the BLM flag, but any flag. I could ask you to fly a Christian flag, or a thin blue line flag, or a satanic flag. And if you start telling one person no, uh, you're going to end up in a lot of trouble as a school board or, or as a superintendent. Because somebody who has some money is going to sue you, and you're going to lose. So the, and I, I agree almost completely, the purpose of the policy 
Um, and again, PHO would be the best guide um, to be able to say. The purpose of the policy is to make it clear that you as the government body, which is what you are, have the authority to make this decision. Um, what that does is it takes away the arbitrary and capricious nature of me you know, saying no to one person and yes to another. Right? If there's no policy that guides it, even though I may have them follow a process and I may have a protocol, if there's no policy that exists, uh, there is a good argument that can be made that, hey, you know, he's being arbit ar arbitrary in his decisions because what's he basing it on? Um, and, and, yeah, we would lose. Uh, but the policy... Now, now we wouldn't lose them. even if the board voted on it? What's that? Like you said, if you well, leave see, it to the board without the guidance in the policy of kind of a procedure to approve or what, or some type of language in there of what would be approved and what wouldn't be approved. And so I would say that PH, I'll give you my opinion, and then PH would be the, the, the person to, to, to confirm or, or deny, is this idea that, you know, you are, the, you are the government as far as this is concerned. When the board chose not to make a decision, you set a precedent. And the precedent was that it's in the superintendent's hands. Uh, you know, as the final say, it was actually in the, in the, in the building level hands, you know, that particular decision, we'll use that as the example, um, but it was in my hands. Um, and that's put it into the hands of a person who has no policy to guide what I should be doing. And again, like I said, let's go back to the second part, the more philosophical argument that I had was when you put it in my hands, you do have two executive limitations that kind of speak to that. But I could equally argue from both sides. And so if I can argue equally from both sides, then there's no clarity there. There's no direction of what your intent is of the board because I'm your agent to carry out your intent. And so it just, it, it, it's, it's just it's very interesting, um, and, you know, the, the more I think about it. Um, but if you guys had made the decision as the government body, it probably would have been a little bit stronger. But they could probably, because it would have That's set the precedent was, that it's in, yeah. in your hands as the voting and the representatives. Um, but still, somebody could easily make the argument that you're being arbitrary and capricious because you don't have a set way of... Right, that, that's what I was saying is in, in the policy, does the policy have to have some guidance of how we make our decision on what it, would be acceptable? Depending upon what your policy would be. Um, if you make a policy that, you know, no flag except the, that, that is for government communication can be up there, you know, so that would be the state and the, 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 the federal government, then that's just what it is. If you make a policy that, yes, you know, we will consider, but we have the final authority, um, then typically there's a protocol that's developed that people have to hop through to have it be considered. And then as long as we follow the same protocol well, for, for everyone, each. that's the equality yeah. and that avoids the, the, the capricious, potential capricious and, and that And that procedure doesn't necessarily have to be in the policy, but we would have to have some have type of... No, in, in that case, in, lots of times what you do with, a, with that is you guys develop the policy and that's where you would say as part of the policy and the superintendent will develop the protocols about you know, what hoops people have to hop to before they can bring it to the board. You know, something along those lines. And again, our conversation isn't a perfect one because we're talking on the, on the fly, but PH would be the guiding um, person on this. Um, so would you, would the next step be that if, that you and PH would bring in some policies? If some you decide that you want to pursue it? And, and the, I'd, I'd connect with Pietro to, to see, you know, you know, give us a variety of, of, of possibilities out there. And, you know, what, what is your recommendations and, and why? And maybe even have them come and talk to the board about it. Right. Yeah. Right, because I, I emailed back and forth with him a little bit um, after yeah, Pacha and I time, no, but. Um, <laughs> spoke with him. And, and even because, I mean, and, and it's not black, I mean, the law... It's not black and white as much as we would think it would be, but he he did state to me in the email, and I I don't have it memorized, but 
basically that even the board can run into an issue with if you know of course he would be guiding us and trying to create a policy that is protective but if the board does go down that road of wanting to be the arbiter of, of what flag gets to be then it gets then much more in some ways we then create that same public forum issue again but again you know we would at least have it in policy and he would be helping us and guiding us but you know it is a pretty yeah. big can of worms and 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 so in the environment that we're in right yeah. now i think it's pertinent that you know we at least investigate it <laughs> yeah and I was one. I mean, did some things happen that made this also come to light? I mean, just because I know one of the things you're concerned about is just the climate, overall climate in the schools, yeah, in the we, community to make sure that everyone is feeling. There, the amount of divisiveness right now, um, people are a lot bolder. Um, people are willing to be threatening, be on the verge of threats. Um, and I'm being trying to be sensitive to the fact that people may push things that we may, if we don't have a policy that we may have to do that are going to cause even more divisiveness. And I don't want violence in my schools. Um, you know, it's, it's, maybe it's a little bit selfish, but I, I don't think it is. I personally would like to get back to the days where schools are about educating kids. You know, we have other things that we have to deal with the, the, that are in society that are important to educate students about. But I don't want to be end up being a, a, a grounds or a forum for political discourse. If people want to have political discourse, that's what your legislators are for. Go camp out in front of their, their offices and get them to do their jobs. Um, but I, I want to be in charge of, 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 of managing a school um, and helping kids learn and grow. Um, doesn't mean I want to shy away from tough issues and conversations with students and and, and things like that, but I, 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 I worry about that divisiveness and I worry about it spilling over, disrupting the operations of the school or spilling into violence. Um, best, way, best way at this, this, this time of night I can, I can, I can say it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so as a board we need to then uh, make a motion as to whether or not we want to uh, have Lane and Pietro meet and bring forth some some policies for us to consider and and look at. So, can I have a motion to that effect? From someone. I make the motion that we have Lane and Pietro research a potential flag policy for us, the district, and present it at the next board meeting. <coughs> I'll second, Megan. Second from Megan. Uh, any additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Raise your hand. aye. aye. Okay, so we will we will do that. So Elaine, you you know what you need to do. Uh, next up, student behavior plan collaboration and staff training. So this is a, and I don't really have a lot for you, and I'll kind of explain things um, where this is coming from. Uh, so every couple of years, you get a, a, an audit. Um, this was from the special education audit, and they identified two things. They said, "Hey, you're kind, you're kind of missing these things that we'd like like you to see under policy." Um, the two things that they listed, um, and we've been trying to get clarity from them, are very cryptic. Um, they can't explain them to us well. Uh, they can't provide us models of what other districts have, and it doesn't actually look to me like it's a policy, it's a protocol, which would be my, my responsibility, not yours. Mm -hmm. But because of the lack of clarity, and because typically we have um, Pietro or, um, or, or his wife, who also is uh, legal counsel, does more of the civil rights side of things, um, craft the language, I've reached out to Heather and say, hey, do you mind connecting? seeing what you can get out of them um, as somebody who crafts a lot of the, the language around these things for the state anyway um, and see what they're talking about and so she's working on that right now is it a policy is it a, is it a is it a which would be a, a board uh, piece is it a protocol which would be my piece 
um, and is there a model out there? And if there's not a model, be specific with this about what it is it needs to say so that Heather can craft the, the best language around it. And so I'll say that this is just an update right now because you know there was no details that they could give us. Um, and I also want to make sure I'm, I'm not I'm not throwing the AOE under the bus. I don't want people to think that. I think they, they are responding to changes that are happening in terms of the federal laws for grants and things. And so they're trying to create this stuff as fast as they can as things are changing very quickly. Um, and so I think that's a part, part of the problem is we're trying to understand these things. Um, so that work is there. I give, I give Heather a lot of credit. She responded immediately before vacation has been working on it. But of course with vacation that put a, a, lot, of, a lot of people were out of com commission um, relaxing as they should be. Um, and so it kind of slowed things down. So if that ends up coming out that it is a policy piece, that will I will bring that out in front of the board when it's in a full format, as Heather suggested. Okay. All right, and then uh, Linda, you wanted to let yeah us know about um, where things are with so we're going to have this. So Jeff Francis just got back to me. I think it was yesterday because I sent mm -hmm. another reminder out. He can't attend the meeting. I know mm -hmm. he's usually the one that does the majority of the talking. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what you guys want to do about that. He has another commitment. Um, Mark McDonald said he could come. Larry Satkiewicz can come. And Jay Hooper responded um, that could come. I don't know if that's Sue from the VSBA. So yeah. Is she still there in that? There were transitions going on, so I don't know. I sent it to her. She didn't respond. but. Yeah. So I don't know what, you, what your pleasure is, guys, because we always do it in February before town meeting. So if you want to mark Larry and Jay come, they, they will. But Jeff can't. We do as a superintendent's group. I give that, uh, Libby at uh, Montpelier a lot of credit. She set, set up the meeting between the superintendents and the legislators um, for, I think it's February 11th um, mm -hmm. in, in Montpelier. Um, you know, so we'll be going to that. I'll be able to bring back at least notes and about the conversations and what people are most worried about in terms of what they're talking about with uh, the new legislation that may be coming down the pipe. Um, if that's helpful. But what does the board does the board feel like this is helpful information in terms of uh, sort of knowing what's coming down? I mean, a lot of times Lane is providing us with that information so and I'm I mean when we think about sort of what we're what we're tasked to do in terms of you know sort of monitoring the district and and looking at our outcomes I mean it oftentimes what's going on in the legislature gives us an idea of sort of what the emphasis is or a financial impact yes. but usually give us that information I don't know if folks feel like they want to have that time with the legislature or the legislators ourselves um, or if we feel like we have issues that we want to make sure that are related to the to the district from the board perspective Because that would be. I have always felt that Lane, in his monthly reports, is that he's touching on the the topics that are, um, in, you know, happening in Montpelier, happening locally, and I do feel like our representatives are available to us outside of that meeting if we mm -hmm. need them. So I don't I don't feel strongly about having the meeting with them. Mm -hmm. Mark, Mark was by the central offices for the holiday. Right? In, and in the past, Jeff Francis has, has had a lot of detail where the legislators right. haven't. Right, know, they're they've been there for any questions and more than willing right. to answer questions, but they haven't really he, gone in detail like Jeff did. Yeah, right. Jeff has a broader view um, because they typically the legislators typically sit on a specific committee, so they'll have a lot of details about that, but yeah. not maybe not as much. Um, yeah. So again, we as a board, we need to think about whether or not that's worth our time and given the limited number of meetings that we have and the business that we need to 
to be focused on is that a good use of our time for for that meeting or do we want to do something different I agree with Ashley <clears throat> I just wonder if it would be odd to rescind the invitation <laughs> <laughs> right? I, right you know we've reached out to them some have accepted yeah I, I mean it's fine and and again I, I do agree right. um, there would be a short talk this time instead of with Jeff. No. <laughs> but I, I, I can explain. I mean, they know Jeff does most of the. I mean, they're, they're pretty low key. Yeah. Not, right. yeah. Or we could just say, you know, Jeff couldn't make it, so we're not. We're going to decide it. We're not going to yeah. do it this yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, I can take care of that. I don't know. What, 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 what I mean, yeah, with COVID, the board. Yeah. I think that's, I'm, I would agree with that. It's fine. Okay. So disinvite them. Please. Okay. Well, disinvite them. <laughs> Excellent. Disinvite. <laughs> okay. Uh, so next up, we're to the the consent agenda. Um, and as listed here, we have a lot of uh, items on here. And again, Lane, because we you already went over the the lead mitigation costs, and you guys voted to add them to the consent agenda, they're already there. Okay, yeah. so so we can can we um, then take this whole consent agenda and yeah. and vote it as one slate? Yeah, unless you guys got questions. Are there any questions on the consent agenda items? Um, I had one, the sabbatical yeah, request. Me too. Um, yeah, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell I'll tell you the so there the teachers in their CBA um, are allowed a sabbatical um, and the past practice has been that it is always granted and it's on a first come first serve basis um, and so the teacher that is requesting it is the person who has requested it there are no real requirements on that teacher um, under under the CBA. Um, so, so I'm sorry, there's only one teacher who has requested it? There's only one teacher that is, who has requested it. And it's usually they, the, the board, when there's requests, they, they, they grant one, um, and it's always been first come, first serve. Oh, I see. So we're not, we're not talking about the teacher. We're talking about are we going to allow there to be a sabbatical? Uh, yeah, I think you're kind of locked into doing it. Because okay. it's part of the so, collective bargaining agreement. Yeah. We can't not... Well, we're in the, CBA, we only have to one a year, right? Right. Yeah, and then this yeah. is the one. Yeah, potentially, I think potentially, if there's a, I have to go back and read it. If there's a second, you know, there, there's a possibility of a second either. On, I think, but I think it has to be unpaid if that's the case. So that's my question, like logistically. So it's a pay. They're paid their salary for the year. Um, the work that they do, it, there's no requirements around the work that they do and how they bring that back. So it doesn't have to be, it can be whatever they want. Um, and then the district is li is, has the liability of paying for that long-term sub for one year. For the coverage of the, the person to replace them for the year. Yes. So that was, that was, that was 74,000 of that increase. Um, and benefits for the year? For, if for required, the yeah. Hmm. So, so that, if we're that, voting on it, what would be a reason that we would not approve it. I mean, it be, and, and I'm not saying I need to or want to, but we don't know who it is. We know we're going to send one. Why I in the world would we? I think under past practice, I don't believe you can deny it. I mean, can, can we ask for, like, reason for it? You know, are, are they getting, you know, continuing their education, or is it for an extra year vacation? Uh, I don't believe so, but let me give me a second to see if I can find it here. Not if it's guaranteed in their contract. I just, if it is, typically, and we're not deciding who gets it, yeah. <laughs> then, then why are we talking why about are, it? Why are we? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, we it's, it's a pro forma. That. That's why it's in the consent agenda. So I, I'm, 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 I'm in agreement the that this is language that should be changed. Yeah. And I've really tried to change it, but again, just, they have the right to say, no, it's ours and we reject it. Now, can we delay this? And then we request 
since you know we get they get one a year and it's, it's just the, I guess it's not not the January it's the um, school year correct uh, the, this is the t there is a time frame when the decision has to be made in this event which uh, which is uh, I, I'm just saying if we don't get one a year and we don't have any information on this one do we need to approve it right now I would argue give me just a moment so 13 maybe, maybe another one would be you guys are the first folks okay. that have actually asked questions about this, so this like, is good. Don't they have to come back for two more years? They have to come back for, that's after? the one requirement, is that if yeah. they go off okay. on sabbatical, they owe us two years. Okay. Where's page 13? Yeah, again, it, it's not, it, it's logistical. I, I'm, I don't want to go down a road where we're talking about the contract. The contract is the contract, and and you know, any approved one yeah. year exactly. It's but that's what I'm, it all the time. <laughs> I'm thinking like you know, if we only approve one a year, is this the one we want to approve this year, or is there going to be another one? That no, it's always been first come, no. first serve. So there's a there's a date that it opens up for people to apply. So whoever's uh -huh. got the earliest time stamp oh. on it. Okay. So Lane, do we typically have one a year? Uh, we did until COVID started. Okay. Uh, I just don't ever remember talking about this in the past. No, because uh, you guys were under mostly under COVID. A lot of you. Uh, leave policy sick leave. What the heck is it? Was it one? I don't think that. I don't know. There was one a couple years ago. Sabbatical leave with pay shall be granted. Leave. Which is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. um, as long as they've been employed by the district for 15 consecutive years, which we did check out. Okay. 15 consecutive years. Yeah. yeah. Upon completion of sabbatical leave, a teacher shall be obligated to teach in the Orange Shopless School District for a minimum of two consecutive years. Any teacher who fails to complete said years uh, shall reimburse the district. Lane, so for it to get onto the consent agenda, those boxes have already been ticked. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. No That's more than one shall be approved in any school year. Then I can make a motion to approve the consent agenda. <laughs> you can't even block that. <laughs> so hold on. Second. Oh. <laughs> the OSSD board shall have the ultimate authority to grant or deny or may delegate that authority to the appropriate local board, which that language doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, but your past practice has been that it, it's always been accepted and it's always been first, first come, first serve. It's just interesting. Yeah. But thank you for yeah. reading that. And they get 50% of their salary for the year. But the person who's replacing them gets... Right, they're a full-time person. Okay, so we had I have a motion, a motion on the floor from Ashley to approve the consent agenda. We had a second mm -hmm. over here from Megan. Any discussion, further discussion? All those in favor of passing the consent agenda, you say aye, aye. raise aye. your hand, aye. Okay, so the consent agenda passes. Um, Ooh. Thanks for coming. Thank you for Okay. Yeah, take care. Be safe. So we're down to our closing. Um, any things you want to point out from just incidental information about what's going on in the district? No, uh, unless there are questions on the lead lead piece. Uh, just so just so folks know, um, I actually David's comment earlier was good. We actually tried to add a couple of bullets. There's a standard form the state requires us to send out if there's a lead hit. Yeah. And yeah, it does. If it doesn't have a lot of information, so, do, so we tried to put in a couple of bullets to say, hey, mostly sinks, um, you know, like, like Brookfield, it was, it was a sink. It's never used for drinking water anyway, plus the fact they're not drinking any of the water there because we're supplying bottled water for all of them um, had been, been for years because the, the, the water's not, not palatable. It's safe, but not palatable. Um, the high school, just so folks know, uh, my understanding is that the, the smaller schools have always been tested for lead and copper. Um, it's a requirement because they're under well water. 
because Randolph High School um, and Randolph Elementary are under municipal water, there was never, prior to this law, law change, there was never a real requirement to do um, as regular testing on it, you know, as was done at the smaller schools. So um, that's, that's kind of a... It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous law because yeah. the lead can't doesn't come from, doesn't come from, from the water. water itself. It's the, the piping and the fixtures in, in the building yeah. or the transmission, but it doesn't come from the well or the water itself. So, yeah, and so and so people aren't aren't freaking out. The um, the majority of it was was uh, classroom sinks that aren't used for drinking. Um, there was a, a spigot, there were actually three spigots in the kitchen, only one used from consumption, and that one was borderline. So in other words, uh, 15 parts per billion is the EPA actionable limit, state limit is four parts per billion. This was at four parts per billion when it came out. So it needs to be replaced, so I'm not, I don't want to minimize it, but it's not like it, so yeah. I mean, it, and it's, like you said, it's just in the fixture, so it's not a huge issue just yeah. change the fixture out and should cure the problem should cure the problem and it is a template that you have to send yeah. out to yeah right yeah so but the it, big point is what they can understand. yeah but david Dave, Dave i agree agree with them 100 <laughs> percent. we did try to minimize as much as we could by adding a few bullets in there but it wasn't enough so. okay so um just a recap um We've approved the budgets and warnings. We've set our uh, budget meeting for February 22nd, Tuesday, in the media center, or no, in the auditorium at 6 o'clock. Uh, Lane and Pietro are going to get together some flag policies uh, for us to take a look at, and hopefully maybe Pietro can attend to just sort of help us walk us through that, maybe. Um, and, and you're going to follow up with Heather on the special education student behavior planning yeah, and stuff and let us know if we need to make a policy. It's easy when stuff is clear because you can just do it, but this is... This All is right. Beautiful. And then, Megan, you uh, evaluated how we were doing. Yeah, uh, uh, I thought it was a good meeting, well attended. Everyone had things to say, questions, comments. Overall, good. Awesome. All right. Um, so we are going to. No, we're not going to adjourn this we're meeting. Going to go to executive session. We're going to go into executive session uh, for labor negotiations so, information. So Rachel and Pat are going to switch over to the executive session link. Do you need a motion? No. no. Okay. Well, uh, and you, we have to have him, he's got to get Shut his down, stuff right. right. Yeah. There'll be a vote afterwards. Executive session for Most likely. No, I was assuming it was Orca, but. So did I, but now that they're not there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we're back in regular session. Do I have a motion regarding the bus driver's contract? Yes, so this is Megan, and I'm going to make a motion the board approves the bus driver contract as um, written and that we would authorize Lane to sign the contract um, after the bus drivers sign an agreement. I second. This is Ashley. Okay, any discussion? All right. All those in favor of the motion, um, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Looks like the motion passed. Wonderful. Um, so, Lane, you'll take care of that then. Um, do I have an emotion uh, to end this meeting? So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Good night. Do we we don't have to uh, we don't have to uh, we're out of executive session. Not the form. People is on the Yeah, we just voted on well, the then. contract. Right, we're done. right. But yeah. we don't have to vote. Do we have to vote to adjourn our normal no. meeting? No, we don't necessarily do. We're not a board of this size. Quirky in some in some cases yeah. it depends upon how many people are on the board.